up here without looking at that. We're looking at the front of the clay. We just feel that's my braille. As we start to separate, just keep going until it goes off. Don't stall out. Two, stretch. Oh, thank you. filming, I had the opportunity to sit down and observe two of the best coaches in the game. During this time, I saw what I could only call pure passion for the sport and coaching. Besides their shooting accolades, the number of champions that these two have developed and trained is nothing short of impressive. The sit down with these two has always been on my list and it's been there for a long time. I'm happy to say I've got it done and I'm looking forward to another chance in the future, but I'm more than happy to share it with you guys as channel supporters. Without further ado, I give you Dan Carlisle and Steve Liberta. My name's Steve Liberta. I'm a shooting instructor in the Houston area. Um, I work out of American Shooting Centers, Westside Shooting Grounds. Uh, mainly, a lot of my clientele is all over, meaning from my youngest client's probably eight years old, and the oldest is 92. I'll do the same thing. My name is Dan Carlisle. I've been in the shooting industry all my life. I shot my first registered clay in 1969. I tell people that I haven't had a real job yet. All I've ever done is teach people how to shoot and shoot personally myself. I shoot. I'm, uh, I've won in trap, skeet, and sporting clays in my history of shooting. Um, I'm a Hall of Famer, four-time Hall of Fame inductee. Uh, don't know anything else but pulling the trigger. I've been teaching since uh, about 1985. I had my per first paid lesson. I haven't stopped since, and it's something that I love. And I'm hanging out with my buddy Steve. We travel all over the country together. We do lessons everywhere. Uh, we separately go all over the country from California to New York and everywhere else. It's just a job for us. We love this job. It makes us happy. It's something that's uh, in our heart that we want people to do better. A good example would be today with the two boys, the guy, the man and the, and the yeah. son, that have shot a box of shells in their life, and they came to this clinic. Steve had them first, and the hardest part about this game is making people zoom in or focus to the edge of the clay or a spot on the clay so it coordinates the hands and eyes together so the subconscious part of your brain tells you when to fire. He, we struggle with that because we see it all the time. And what happens, it took about a good hour and a half into my session before I could actually, or Steve could actually get them to see the clay clearly before they fire. The problem with our game is uh, the information source in our conscious brain just wants to look at the lead because that's the answer. You know, I got the barrel of the bird, the gap of space and lead they read in a book. And it's so false, it's unbelievable. Our sports, just like any other sport, I'm pretty sure I don't see the baseball bat when I swing it. I don't see the, the, the basketball when I shoot it, I'm looking at the goal where it's supposed to go. That's the concept. But the problem we see daily is people come from the world of measuring, aiming, checking the barrel to make sure they got the lead right. I mean, it's just a huge misunderstanding. It's been going on since the first shotgun was ever invented. You know, that's how it works. So we're glad to be here at Westside. Lori and Dan are great. They have one of the most beautiful facilities in the United States, period. We've been to about every one of them, and they're in the top 10, there's no doubt. And the, they're nice people, they're courteous, they're giving, they do everything that anybody wants them to do here. They have a great membership, they throw good tournaments, they have four full courses, I mean three and four courses, come on, I mean that's the ultimate. What are your thoughts on target setting and difficulty? When you have a club that has three courses, you have an, a beginner course, an intermediate, intermediate course, and an advanced. Our biggest problem in this sport is that most clubs have one course. And what happens is they can't throw anything advanced because the members come out and shoot and they can't hit anything and they're upset. And the problem with our sport is though, we're growing to this 50, 60, 70 yard targets where that's never happened till the last two or three years this has been happening. And now they're lost, they can't hit this stuff. Well, there's a, it's just as easy as a 30 if you know how to hit it. So it's a matter of, you know, a placement of the barrels bigger, the lead's 
the stretch is bigger, everything is bigger. So it's hard for them to wrap around that so they're not successful. And I, on another podcast, I said, you know, some of these tournaments you go to, they're throwing 60 yards on every other station. Full spring, edgy stuff that, you know, if you think about logic, people that support this are A through E. They buy the golf carts. They buy the shotguns. They're buying the shells. They're filling all the tournaments up. The top 30 guys is what they're setting targets for. And personally, I don't think that's right. I think you could set five or six of those stations difficult, not 25 of the stations difficult. Those six or 10 stations would separate all the best players to line it up perfectly, and the D-class and C-class shooters wouldn't suffer. When they go out the driveway with a 65 out of 200 clays, I'm pretty sure they're not having any fun. <laughs> I mean, one guy told me after the Open a few years ago, he said, when I drove out of the driveway, I looked at my wife. She, he, I said, hell with this. I'm going to take up fishing again. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm serious. So, you know, growing the sport is our whole object. You know, Steve and I teach people, beginners, a lot, and it gets them into the sport that buys guns and buys shells and buys carts, and they don't go the other direction. That's my whole big beef about the sport. It should be growing and growing and growing. And Steve and I talked about this the other day. I'm going to change the subject a little bit about the PSC. This is the perfect time that the PSCA should be coming back, right? Right. I mean, we're looking at guys that, like Brandon Powell, just made $35,000 this shoot. That's unheard of. I mean, back in our, my day of winning, you know, if we made $5,000, my God, that was like a million. It was so much. But it's not enough to live on. You still have to have a job. So that's the big part of the PSCA was to build that, you know, till we get to the TV rights so it would allow people to watch which is going to grow the smart sport even more and it's going to allow money to be in the sport by bigger sponsors and it could have worked if we could have had enough money behind it for a few years but the guy or money guy hedged a bunch of uh, propane and up in north and it was the warmest winter they had ever in history and he lost about three million dollars and you know i don't really blame him for bailing out he don't really have a choice kind of you know he pre pledged so much money and it just got taken away real quick i think if we'd have had two or three, four years of it, we could have made it happen. But maybe somebody will come back in, and it is for sale. It's definitely for sale. If anybody wants to buy it, all the rights to it, everything, it's definitely for sale. This is the part of the video that I ask you to like and subscribe. It's free for you. It means the world to me. And I thank you for your support. If you have questions for Dan and Steve, put them in the comments below. What should you look for in a coach? A good coach is somebody you can relate to. I think some people, you know, you got to put your arm around, give them a hug, and then other people, you got to chew on them a little bit, you know, a little tough love. Um, the person who get the message across to their student, I think that's the, the right person for the job. Um, there are some people, and I've, I've had it a couple times where I just said, we're not going to, we're not going to click. You need to go find somebody else. But, you know, um, Getting the message across to each individual, like when we work together, I can say one thing to a person and they get it like that, and he's been trying to say it another way. Um, I just think the words you use and how you bring it across uh, and get that message across to the student. Kind of a lot alike, really, in our personalities. And, you know, first of all, you have to have the information. You can't be a coach. You know, really, you need that. Most coaches are good shots, too. You know, you go through a class or a school, you get a certificate, you do so many hours, and that allows you to get to the next level and the next level. We all agree with that, you know, but most coaches, the personality, like you just said, is a huge important part of how you relate to people with the information. And you're patting them on the back all the time. When they do good, you tell them that. When they do bad, you tell them that. It's just a straight up job that, you know, I developed this system 20 something years, five years ago, and it's created hundreds of all Americans, hundreds. Most of the time, Steve and I have most of them on the all American teams. And the best shooters, I would say 95 to 97% of the best shooters shoot this system. There's 
there's a, another way to do it and there's other instructors that teach other ways which are fine and they've got some some people that can bang they are awesome they're incredible actually part of it is that talent and part of it is the money behind it to be able to make that talent work after five or six years of doing it before you really step up to that next level some people are even longer than that maybe 10 years before they break through you know that next next level is that's what everybody's after there's a lot of people in that medium range level that can break 90 but they can't break 98 that's the problem and that next level is tough to get you look at an antimatter reese averaging 93 94 95 on 4,000 targets of registered targets a year incredible that's incredible i've been in the 90s most of my career 90 91 sometimes 92. I, I, I thought that was incredible, but 94, 95 is just so off the chart that it's just hard to compete against somebody like that. But that's where our game's coming to. We've got probably 50 of those guys right now that can actually put those kind of numbers up. When back in the day, there was 15 of us that could do it. Now it's just getting bigger. Now it only comes from coaching. The yeah. coaching is where all that comes from, relating to people with some sort of control system that you use. Even Wendell Cherry, has got a, he's got a list of them, and they're fantastic. And his theories and our theories, they don't matter up but the ending is the same so you know it's not so much a, a problem for me to watch Wendell say something that I don't believe in I don't do it that way and I'm not so hard-headed that I would say something against his way I would just think I give the odds I give the percentage brackets on control shooters and move mountain fire shooters that's the two styles really that I work you look at George Digweed 30 year 30 time world champion he's a control shooter you look at uh, uh, Richard Falls and maybe Mickey Rouse and uh, John Bidwell they're all move mountain fire shooters so you all them together is over 50 world championships between four guys incredible right I mean that's unbelievable but that's the two styles that kind of battle each other out you know I'm just proud to be a part of all this and being able to how to come up with something that actually works that teaches people how to be good at it. And the more they stretch, they, they strive for that, the better they get. The more shells you shoot, it's like anything else. I tell my clients, and Steve does too, if we had a dart championship two weeks from now and you threw 10, uh, 50 darts a day and I threw five, who do you think would win that championship in two weeks from now? You. You got 10 times more experience at throwing darts than I do. So obviously, training is a huge important part. That's why shooters aren't just out of the box the first year. It's the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh year before they see the light. Well, that's why all of these kids are getting so good so fast. Parents actually just figured out, you know what? Instead of teaching them one foot of lead, two foot of lead, throw the gun out there, school bus, you know, you get this kid that's 10, 11 years old, doesn't know anything about a shotgun, and you teach him the right way right off the bat, how many times have we seen by the time oh. they're 16, 17, they're, they're winning big shoots, they're incredible. US Opens, you know. We all have them. We had an 11-year-old kid yesterday. It's a phenomenon. He's so good. It's just scaring both of us. Carter. There's two of them, Carter and Cash. And they're buddies, and they shoot together all the time, so they feed off each other, and they shoot our system. We've been teaching them for a while. And they're unbelievable. They're 11. <laughs> 11 years old, and they're breaking in the 90s now already, 92, 93. They, and that little corporate stuff, 98. When they shoot their less TP stuff, they're just... People, when they, the other kids see them, they just turn their head, look the other way. Now, the, you know, they're here, you know, kind of deal. So that's what happens when a Wendell Cherry walks into the shoot, you know, or a Finese, or a uh, Matt Arise, or a Cruz. You know, they walk into the tournament, people see them, oh, God, they're here. They're already beat. They're beat before they even get started. Just how it is. You know, that's that that part of this game that I like. I really like that because it makes people work harder. They take more lessons, they buy more shells, they, they support the industry. <laughs> Without that support, we wouldn't have a sport at all. It is guns, you know. You know guns aren't the, the greatest yeah. thing in America at the moment, you know, but we are shooting guns. But it's a shotgun, it doesn't shoot as far as rifle and pistols, it's not as dangerous, and it's a lot more fun when you're shooting a clay target than a piece of paper. <laughs> at least I think it is. <laughs> Very true. Does age matter when we're talking old eyes versus inexperienced youth take a young kid where well, you mold them 
Okay, that's what we do. Like we, a blank just, slate. It's piece by piece until they the the mountains formed, and they're there. They're there forever, up until their mid sixties, even later. As long as they have good eyes, as long as they still can see, that's all they need. You never lose your hand and eye ability. You still have it to the day you die. And you really do. That's that's just a big oh, uh, you're twenty five years old and I'm sixty. Oh, I don't have that hand and eye anymore. That's a bunch of crap. I mean, <laughs> you couldn't be able to drive your car down the road. You couldn't do it. So you know, it's just uh, it's, most of this. If you hear about old people, old people can shoot. I mean, there's guys that are in their 50s and 60s. They're just as good as they were when they're in their 30s. I mean, if I would have kept shooting, I mean, I've got glaucoma. I've got 50% loss in my right eye, and it's it's a strain. Uh, it's clouding over. It's starting to get in the hours of my eyes, so I'm still right eye dominant. I can still shoot. I'll just don't want to train. I've been shooting competitively since I was 14 years old. I shot in the military as well. I spent seven years in the Army shooting Olympic trap and skeet. I shot 750 shells a day the last four years, 500 a day the first three years. And that's a lot of shells. So after about 50 years of it, I get a little bit tired of doing it. You know, it's not that I just don't want to train and go out. You take a Wendell Cherry, and he's absolutely right on this, 100%. And we're friends, and occasionally he'll call me and ask me a question about something, and I'll do my best to help him. And he'll empty the trap on a birdie on his weaknesses. He trains on weaknesses. So when he struggles with a bird, the next day he goes out and shoots the trap empty. He'll go load it himself and shoot it empty again. That's a player. He's a player because now he just took a weakness and made it into a positive. Now, that doesn't bother him. Next time he sees that bird, he will not miss it. That's what makes you good in this sport. People have a hard time with that. Most people aren't tournament shooters. I mean, there's only probably 15 or 20 percent of the people that are that shoot clays. There's millions of them. They're not tournament shooters. How many we have in the NSCA now? Like 80,000, something like that. I mean, there's millions of people that shoot clays rec on rec recreational rec basis every week. But they're not shooting tournaments, they're out having fun with their friends and just getting a little better and a little better. They take a few lessons so they can beat their friends. That's what they do. And almost everybody that we had today, I don't think any of them shoot tournaments actually, do they? Maybe- Just uh, the husband and wife just started. Uh, Bob and what was her uh, name? Uh, yeah. Maria. Yeah. And so they're the only ones out of all the people we had today that even shot a tournament before. They just want to get better. They want to go out with their friends. They want to go dove hunting, get their limit instead of nothing. So so it's just most of what's going on in sporting clays in America that the competitive part of it's really small compared to the growth of it. So I think now that there's money in the sport, this change could this this game could possibly change, Steve. It could. The only hard part about it, and you know it through the PSCA, this game is hard to film. It's hard to put on TV. You know, most people when the PSCA came out, you know, I'd watch people watch. They're like, oh yeah, let's watch it. And they're like, what are they shooting at? You know, it's just hard to pick up the clay on the screen. So, you know, people that know what's going on, know what you're shooting at, but to grow people into this sport, it's, it's just really hard to put on TV. And if they turned it on and just saw, saw a bunch of guys out there with guns making noise and they can't see the clay on the, on the screen, it's difficult. It's just tough. Well, it takes a lot of cameras. You have to have cameras on every station, actually on the trap flying away or flying whichever direction so people can actually see the bird flying in the air as you're shooting it. And it breaks at that moment. That's the only way. But then you're looking at another $100,000 or $200,000 for the next four episodes just to have 15 or 20 more cameramen out there or a remote camera sitting there running for all day. So it, we're getting there. It's going to happen. I hope in my lifetime that I see this happen, that it gets to the point where there's, you know, you just won the $200,000 mm -hmm. championship, things like that. It can be. You know, in the end, when they want to take all of our guns, these will be the last ones they take. The light shotgun will be the last thing they take from us. And I'm pretty sure in this country it's going to be still going on fine for a while, at least through my lifetime or maybe through Steve's too, but maybe not yours, you know, because you're young. But it's, it's growing and it's growing and growing and 
keep going. That's what we want. You know, Steve and I, we've been friends for a long time. We've shot in the same squad for years, years and just having fun, doing the best we can. Even if we win or lose, we're not bitching about it. You know, it's nothing we can do about it. It just wasn't our day. That's just how it is, just how every sport is. You know, the basketball player doesn't make every free throw. You know, you know, the best player in the world doesn't always hit every bird. That's just how it is. So, you know, it's a struggle and competing. Some people just don't want to deal with that pressure. There's so much pressure involved sometimes on these bigger shoots, especially, you know, when you first start, their knees are knocking. So some people just can't deal with it very I well. I saw your knees knock my when knees you were knocked. 30, 40 years into it. My, my knees are knocking. Like <laughs> he goes, my short leg shaking. <laughs> Remember that? Oh, yeah. Is matching your expectations with your input a common problem? We, I mean, just like today, we had a, 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 a man and his boy, and they never hardly even shot before. No. And at the end, they were lights out. It was incredible what they, how well, y'all saw them shoot. They did great. They couldn't hit anything the first three hours, Steve. Was it's not Steve's fault. He's telling the exact same thing I'm telling him. It's just it finally... They started hitting a few and realizing they didn't see the barrel. I said, what did the barrel look like? I didn't see it. That's right. And then they, it just got better and better and better and better. And, and then it's going to get to a point where it's going to level off. And they got to fight for the rest of them. Just like Wendell training or us training going out there shooting 150 of this one bird because it's wearing me out when I see it in a tournament. So I got to conquer this bird so I can shoot four birds better the next shoot. That's really what the game about of any sport is the same way about training. Tell them about the football training, about the coach you told me today about on Friday, oh, Friday, Friday training. Yeah, this that, is very interesting. No different what we did. We watched the uh, Alabama game last night, and they won on fourth down. And I don't know. They were on the 30-yard line. Needed a touchdown to win with 30-something seconds. And they make it. So everybody's like, wow, you know, that was just a lucky throw. Or, you know, they asked the quarterback. He goes, no, we practice that every Friday. Then they asked the coach. And he says, yeah. We practice from the end zone, red, from the 10-yard line, from the 20-yard line, from the 30-yard line. So you're prepared. That's all That's, it's all about. It's the same thing. <laughs> it's the same thing we do. You practice certain things that you're weak at or you know that you have to do in those situations because, you know, they do that. If you make a touchdown, you kick a field goal and by the second or third when you've got to do the two-pointer and you start at the 30 every time or something until one of them wins. And that's how they do it. Well, you got to train at that. You just can't, okay, well, we're doing this this time, and you're not familiar with it. Well, dang, probably going to lose. Probably going to lose. You don't have the plays for that. And it's the same thing. It's no really any different than any other sport. It takes training, dedication. you got to believe. And, you know, it's, it's, it's nerve-wracking. When, when you're in the national championships or the world championships and you got three stands to go and a person comes up to you and says, hey, Dad, if you run this out, you're going to win it. <laughs> okay now you think about that you go to the next station you get through that you go to the next station you get through it again the last station I mean your knees are knocking honestly they're absolutely it makes you nervous as can be now I've never been the ice man there's a lot of guys out there that look like they have no nerves maybe inside they do but me mine are on my outside okay I mean honestly I've had my pants like shaking like this before and turn around and look at my buddies and go are my pants leg shaking? And they go, like, yeah, <laughs> that's just the way it is. Just, I, I'm just one of those guys, I have it on the outside instead of the inside. And I step back, take a few breaths, get it on my chest by doing something like that. It gets everything, my thought pattern over here instead of over here where I can't think clearly. So a couple deep breaths, get your mind back together and about being clear and oh, what are you going to do to hit this bird? What have I got to do to hit it and go through that routine and hit it? It's just that simple. It's, I've never been the ice man, really. Never. I've always had nerves. Uh, I just fought through them my whole life. He's more of an ice man than I am. You can't even tell anything when he's on a roll. He doesn't look any different. He doesn't He's not doing the chicken scratch on the ground and Might be a little doing different all this inside. weird stuff. Or, <laughs> you know, looking around, being weird, being different. Otherwise, you know, a little weird. And I'm that way. I'm, 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 I, you can tell when I'm nervous. It's, and I, I can't stop it. It's just part of me. But I get through it. I mean, most of the time I have. I've gotten through it. I just have to step back and just regroup and just take some deep breaths, get some 
I think most of it is I hold my breath a little bit and I don't get enough oxygen to the brain and it just starts racing real fast and that's what I think most people do that have the same kind of problem I have and I just step back, breathe a little bit. And one thing about that, I'm not embarrassed to do it. My father told me a long time ago, he says, son, because I shot trap and you had to keep the rhythm in trap. You know, everybody's got to shoot every second down the line or you're not keeping the rhythm, that's why I missed. You know, that kind of crap. Well. That came from the 60s when they had a handset trap, okay? It didn't, they didn't have carriages. They had a little boy in there about 14 years old with a box of birds, and when the machine come around, it had a one second delay safety. He had one second to put it on, get his hand off and grab another clay, one second. Every second when that, if you, for instance, if I was a leader and I'm on post one and I get a left, and I crush that left. If he's on post two and calls pull, one second later, he gets the same bird. So in the old days, that's why they've got an interrupter. Because in the old days, that leader shot five birds. He didn't know where they were in trap. And everybody else shot the same bird. Exactly, same bird. 25 times in a row and they move. 25 times in a row and they move. So they invented this interrupter, which makes the machine go all over the place. It might go that way one time and hang, and then over here, and then in the middle. So you can't do that anymore. So what's so important about the rhythm <laughs> anymore? It's out the door. So my father told me, he said, boy, he called me boy, never called me by my name. He said, boy, I don't care what it takes for you to be ready to fire. If it's one second or 20, you make sure you're ready visually and ready mentally to call pull. And I went, yes, sir. And I did. I did. And there was a lot of people that really didn't like shooting with me because I might have taken four, five, eight seconds on this shot and only three seconds on the next one. I shot when my head cleared and more my, what, I, what I wanted to see out in front of the trap to be able to hit the bird. That's what I did. I didn't care. International trap was 12 seconds. I, I usually took about eight seconds. It's about my average, seven, eight seconds to get ready to fire. And it was a 12 second rule. What do you think about time limits while shooters are in the box? I'm going to give you an example. With the last national championships I shot with these guys, we're behind three really good shooters. They take a minute or two minutes per pair. I watched one of them miss a bird and put his arms like this for five minutes. We're on about the middle of this 10 station course, right? We're in the middle. We had five stations to go. We drive out to the left so we can see down the line. It's not a single soul on the line. Not one person shooting. They have backed up five stations already. There's six, five to 10 squads behind us. I look at them and we're all shooting bad. And I look up, and this is against the rules. And we look at them, I look at them, I said, let's go around them. Oh, we can't do that. BS, we can't. They can stand there for five minutes and call pull. I can surely go around them. That's gotta be against the rules too. Come on, that's just, that's holding the whole thing up. I mean, you wait 20 minutes per station? And it takes three and a half hours to shoot 175 targets. That's ridiculous. So this year, seconds is an eternity, this year, though. George Digweed, we've been begging for it for years. George Digweed got it done. And praise George for doing that. Because when they asked George, how was the shoot? You won your 30th World Championship and the veteran, first year veteran, you're the champion. He says, what do you think about everything? I think you blokes need a time limit. That's what he said. And he's absolutely 100% right. We need a time limit. And 20 seconds works. And on the bigger shoots, they need a stopwatch and they need to follow that rule so people will quit doing it so everything flows properly. Okay, it should flow, should to take a couple hours to shoot 100 birds in that rotation, not three or four hours. Ridiculous. So it's just slowing everything down. As a complaint department, that was always my biggest complaint, watching these guys take four or five minutes per pair. And there's four of them out there. On the other end of that spectrum, you get some people that go, Where's, what's the rush? Where's the fire? You know, when they're going through their pairs. And it's like, well, I don't want to hold anybody else up. Well, you're taking five or six seconds in between. That ain't holding anybody up. You know, you paid your entry fee. I always tell them that when you step in that box, you paid for it. It's your piece of real estate. Get your mind right. Take your five or six, seven seconds. Who cares? 
<laughs> Big shot. What do you have? You know, Who cares? Not really You're not holding it. anybody up. You know, it's like George said, you know, I laugh because I heard it. I didn't hear him say it, but another guy mm-hmm. told me this. He says, what the heck are they thinking about? Just missing? I mean, how do you <laughs> think for five minutes on something? What would you be thinking? I mean, missing has to be coming in there somewhere. And maybe when it does, you have to take another minute and a half to get it out of there. I, I, it, I don't know. I really don't. I think maybe they're just hitting reset on their 20-second routine 40 times, and that's how we're getting to five minutes. Yep. Yeah, and that's sure. like they pulled the yep. plug out well, and got a reboot. <laughs> and if you think about that group of 10 or 15 that do it, most of them went right in the crapper for the next four or five tournaments. They didn't win anything at the Nationals today. <laughs> No, 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 they didn't win anything at the Nationals. The guys that won were taking five seconds, eight seconds, seven, ten seconds. That's what they were doing. So, I mean, even the, the, the golly, a routine only takes about five, six seconds to run and another three seconds to get in a position to fire. Really, five seconds would be max, so I'd be ten seconds altogether. And wow, I just can't wrap around it. I don't even get it, really. I, I don't even, I don't know what they could be thinking about that long uh, to be able to, to hit another one pair or one bird. I, I just don't get it. I mean, you know, you? No, not at all. What do you think about shoot offs under the lights? Well, uh, I think they do that just for the entertainment state of it. And then and the lights are cool and we got a stadium full of people. They stay there instead of driving home and nobody's there when they shoot off. You know, not everybody, everybody, people love watching the English shoot against the Americans. And, you know, they've always stumped us for years. Only in this last maybe six or eight years, maybe 10, that we're starting to even penetrate them. You know, even George said at one time, the Yanks have arrived. And we have. We've got four or five world championships now and through Americans. Incredible. You know, in 1999, I was second behind George. And we walk out to the, to the, under the lights, and I'm a terrible light shooter. And we went out to under the lights, and I was, uh, I was uh, uh, 10 birds behind George in second place. <laughs> so when we walk out to this thing, and all English and me, I was the only American. And we walk out there, and George looks over at me and says, Dan, are you nervous? <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, George, if you break a zero on the first stand, I might start getting a little nervous. <laughs> he laughed. And when it was all over, he had 11 bird lead over me. <laughs> I did win second. I was the first guy on the podium for his country, which just made me feel pretty good. Even though it was a silver, still okay. Nobody's expecting to beat those guys anyway. We were just starting. They had a 40 year jump on us. 40 years they were shooting sporting before we ever started. We shot our first clay here in 1985. I was the chief shooting instructor for the USSCA. I raised about $18,000 through my, some of my wealthy friends to send the first US team to England to shoot the world championships for the USSCA. I shot a 78. I won the international championship. <laughs> All the international people that come there. George shot 96. That tells you how, how advanced we were then, <laughs> knowing nothing. We were shooting 25 and 30 yard crossers. It was hard. <laughs> My very first station, I was telling people to this today, I'll never forget it. It was a tower, and it was a big, tall trees with this little opening. It was about 50, 50, about a 40 yard opening. And the tower, you could see it through the trees a little bit. It had a 90 millimeter on full spring, as fast as you could throw it on edge, ripping across that opening. I never touched it. <laughs> I had no idea. I mean, are you kidding me? I broke a zero on that station. That was my first station. <laughs> oh boy. I said, man, they're in a different world. Everything's just fast and yeah, it's not real, real edgy, but everything's fast, fast, fast. They're just in a different level. Look at us now. Look what we're turning into. The same exact thing they are. That's we are starting to de- develop that same mentality as they did. And of course, now that there's money in the sport, man, I'm just praying that it just keeps going like this and makes guys actually be able to make a living. It would have been great to be able to make a living in this sport, you know, to, on your winnings like golf or tennis yeah. or whatever, you know, sports related stuff. And it looks like it's about to happen, really. You look at the Florida shoot, a couple hundred grand in it. You know, the, the, the yeah, what's the Jack name? Jack Lynx. Yeah, the, the Lynx shoot. And then you, the U.S. Open starting to put some money in it. 
this 20,000 for the Nationals now instead of five. And I, I mean, wouldn't Brandon walk out of there with four, 34,000 or some, something like that? That's a decent check. Now, if you did that three, four times a year, you can actually make a pretty good living shooting. At least you're not a shooting bum, you know? You can still pay your bills. Well, that's the way I look at it. So I'm just glad that it's starting to happen now, especially for all these young kids growing up. There's an actual future in this. In 15, 20 years from now, it could be three times that much. And we're watching on TV like golf with the big cameras and they're on it, watching the bird fly out of the trap in slow motion and everybody's Pin, I mean, the editing would be much easier and better. I mean, I've done some of that, some of that work. I know all about it. I've done a lot of this kind of stuff, and, and I, I've just been waiting for this moment, really, to see this sport be something special before it's all over, because, you know, I feel like I had a big part of it, you know, in, in the beginning of it, to the, hopefully to the end of it, to, to my end anyway. What message do you have for a serious competitor? Get a great coach. That's the biggest thing. I always, uh, you know, like I said before, you get you get somebody that's brand new. I always call them like a blank slate or a, a, a lump of clay that you can mold any way you want. And uh, this way, they don't develop any bad habits, and uh, they get taught the right way, and then they can just advance through the ranks, and they rise fast. Ask him. I've done more things wrong with a shotgun, I think, sometimes than I do right with a shotgun. <laughs> well, you know, you get into that slump and you get, you get back on track. But um, I, re I really believe that, that solid coaching is the way to advance the fastest. It's the, it's the only way to advance fastest. I mean, look at these two guys today, they, they'll be in C-class in a month or two. I mean, go from E-class to C-class that quickly. Within four, five, six shoots, they're, they're going to get punches like crazy. It's just how it works. They just were understand. They get it. They just get it. Maybe we say it in a very simple way to them. Anybody has had a lesson from me, I feel like I gave you your money's worth. If I don't, I don't charge you if I don't feel that way. Both of us are like that. We give 110% every minute you filmed a lot of it today didn't you yeah you yeah. see me you see me slacking no no there's no slack in what we do it's a job for us it's, it's a truly a job for us they were and here's <laughs> the truth about it we love it we love doing this it's so much fun it's unbelievable to take an 11 year old that can break 90 something in a matter of a year or so <laughs> my god i mean you molded that kid to the proper understanding of mechanics and the proper understanding on how to truly focus to the clay the way you're supposed to. And there's visual structure to that and that you have to learn all kinds of things that it's just a list of stuff. It's a mile of stuff. And it takes a few years to wrap around it. And we love working with kids. We do it a lot. We do a lot of kids work. Because the future of our sport period, the future altogether. And I do agree with, with Steve, you need to hire a good coach for your kid or yourself so you really get a true understanding of the mechanics and how to look at the clay. If they can do that and, and can see the shot, you're good. If you ask a coach, can you see the shot flying by the bird if I miss or if I hit it? And they go, no, I can't see the shot. Go find somebody else. <laughs> I'm sorry for you guys that can't see the shot that I said that, but it's absolutely a fact. You can't call the shot if you can't see the shot flying by the clay. <clears throat> Here's what they do. You're behind it. You're behind it. You're behind it every time you miss. <laughs> and you could be a foot and a half in front of it. Okay? That's where it comes from. So you take a window and, you know, these guys that are really good at it, they, I can count the pellets to this very day. They can too. So can Steve. It's not It's easy to do. You just got to stand behind people long enough and you'll start seeing it. It's just something that happens. And when it starts to happen, it's going to improve your coaching ability tenfold because you're telling the truth, absolute truth of where you shot, then you can fix that then, okay? That's how it works. That's what I believe as a coach. You have to have a good understanding of fundamentals. If you have to go to school with that, or if you have to get coaches, say for, you get classes from Steve on a monthly basis for a year, and you want to be a coach, he's going to teach you everything about being a coach. If he has to make you look over his shoulder while he's firing the gun, are you with me? That's how it works. And there's a, they're far and few between. There's thousands of them, but there may be six or eight that's actually really good. That really
really believe in what they do. They do it for a living. You know, the weekend warrior coach is a little bit sketchy. Okay, they're not professionals. They don't really know what we know because we do it every single day of the month except Monday. We're off on Monday. <laughs> And we go hunting or fishing, don't we, Bob? That's right. <laughs> so appreciate Thank you. you having us. Thank you.